The National Desk, America's News, now. This week on the National Desk, unhealthy haze, smoke from a Canadian wildfire sweeping across the U.S. Stay at home and again, no strenuous activities. Ushering everyone indoors. How long the smoke could stick around. Then caught on camera, a wild ride in Texas. What police discover when they arrived on scene. And the PGA Tour and Live Golf teeing up for a merger. Why some are slamming the decision to join the controversial circuit. Outraged, disappointed, angry, disgusted. And later, the fact check team digs into claims China is backing the hacking of U.S. infrastructure. How your health could be at risk in future cyber attacks. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Dee Dee Gatton. On this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week. Starting with former President Donald Trump facing 37 federal criminal charges over his handling of classified information and alleged attempts to obstruct justice. Most of the charges fall under the Espionage Act, according to the indictment unsealed Friday. Trump's aide also facing charges. The DOJ calls him Trump's co-conspirator. National correspondent Atra Elnishar explains how this case could unfold. Good afternoon. Special counsel Jack Smith breaking his silence after the world learned why his investigation led to the historic indictment of a former president. Felony violations of our national security laws, as well as participating in a conspiracy to obstruct justice. Applying those laws, collecting facts, that's what determines the outcome of an investigation. Nothing more and nothing less. The 49-page indictment explaining in stark detail how the classified materials, which allegedly included information on U.S. nuclear programs, were stored on a stage in a Mar-a-Lago ballroom, in a shower, and spilled across a storage room floor. Trump getting his defense in order, announcing a shakeup in his legal team Friday afternoon, and reacting to news his former aide, Walt Nauta, is also indicted, calling the FBI and DOJ corrupt. Accusations of bias being tested against special counsel Jack Smith's choice of where to indict Trump in his home state of Florida rather than the heavily Democratic District of Columbia. Former U.S. Attorney John Fishwick tells me it'll be tough for Trump to claim a Florida jury is biased against him like he did recently in a civil trial in Manhattan. The venue is significant because ultimately that's going to be where the trial takes place and where the jurors come from. Judge Eileen Cannon, who was appointed by Trump in 2020, will reportedly oversee the case, at least initially. And if he's found guilty under those circumstances where the trial was held in Palm Beach with, over a Trump appointed judge, I think it'll give the American people confidence that it was a fair process. What cannot be avoided is the timing of the 2024 presidential election. Ultimately, the judge will determine when the trial occurs. There's no good answer. If it's uh, sooner, it will affect the primaries. If it's later, it will elect the, affect the elections. If uh, there's already been an election, that would change things as well. Many of Trump's fellow Republican presidential hopefuls coming to his defense or at least agreeing with his claims against the DOJ. I had hoped the DOJ would see its way clear to resolve this without an indictment. I, I think this is going to be terribly divisive for the country. Not every Republican agrees. Senator Mitt Romney argues the DOJ's given Trump more opportunities to avoid charges than they'd afford anyone else, pointing out the government has the burden of proving its case beyond a reasonable doubt. In Washington, I'm Atrel Nishar for the National Desk, America's News Now. New details. After smoke from Canadian wildfires swept through the mid-Atlantic this week, the hazy skies are clearing up. But meteorologists say as long as the fires continue to burn in Canada, the lower 48 is likely to see more bouts of smoke this summer. Turning now to your money this week, Goldman Sachs lowered the odds that the U.S. will face a recession in the next 12 months. Now, according to their calculations, that chance now sits at 25 percent, and that's down from 35 percent last March. The company says two major factors contributed to the drop, the debt ceiling being lifted and the banking crisis eased. Other contributing factors include the stabilization of regional banks and the housing industry. The World Bank also signaling increased confidence in the economy, upgrading its 2023 forecast. 
The bank predicts the U.S. GDP will grow 1.1 percent this year, and that's up significantly from the 0.5 percent forecasted back in January. Wall Street entered a bull market this week, meaning the S&P 500 index has risen 20 percent or more from its recent low. The markets rallied largely because, at least so far, the economy has defied predictions by not falling into a recession. Despite this, the Fed likely not done with interest rate hikes. Some experts predict the Fed res to resume hiking rates in July. Developing right now, federal student loan borrowers are keeping a close eye on the Supreme Court. They're waiting for the justices ruling on whether or not the White House overstepped its authority by implementing a plan to forgive some student loan debt. The Congressional Budget Office reports the president's plan would wipe out about $400 billion in federal student loans. Student financial aid expert Mark Kantrowitz estimates around 37 million people would be eligible for some debt forgiveness and about 14 million would have their entire balances erased by the plan. The National Desk, Christine Frizzell, brings us the ins and outs of what's become a contentious debate. In much of the country, school's out for summer. College graduates looking ahead to a future that for many includes repaying tens of thousands of dollars in student debt, with an estimated 43 million borrowers owing more than $1.6 trillion in outstanding federal loans. The question of forgiving some of that debt, a contentious one, as it was back in 2020. My daughter's getting out of school. I've saved all my money. She doesn't have any student loans. Yeah. Am I going to get my money back? Today, there remains a wide range of views, even from students themselves, as relayed to Full Measure's Scott Thuman. When you go to college, you are effectively buying a product, uh, much like a new car. When you go to buy a new car, you have to sign on the dotted line. If you think about what our government is paying for, they're paying up the wazoo for military budgets, for aid in other countries. If the government can, you know, produce this money out of thin air, why can they not do it for us? The White House plan would forgive up to $20,000 for students who went to college on Pell Grants and $10,000 for those without, if specific requirements are met. A bill passed in both the House and Senate blocking the plan, which President Biden vetoed this week. Nearly 90% of those relief dollars go to people making less than $75,000 a year. But student loan forgiveness is anything but guaranteed. The authority of the White House to issue such a plan questioned before the Supreme Court, with a ruling expected soon. The bill is passed. And the bipartisan debt ceiling deal included a mandate that student loan repayments pause during the pandemic, restart by August 30th. I'm Christine Frizzell reporting for the National Desk, America's News Now. Ukraine is launching its counteroffensive against Russia, intensifying attacks in the country's southeast. This marks a significant push into Russian-occupied territory. The Russians have released this new video. They say it shows a Ukrainian armored vehicle in flames after being hit by an artillery shell. It was taken Thursday in the Zaporizhia region. At least nine people have drowned in eastern Ukraine due to flooding from a collapsed dam. The average water level there around five meters deep. Russia and Ukraine have both accused each other of damaging the dam. Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg believes Russia is to blame. Thunberg taking to Twitter, calling it an act of ecocide, writing, our eyes are once again on Russia, who must be held accountable for their crimes. New York is now considering a law to seal some criminals' records from everyone, except certain employers like schools and law enforcement. This week, the Fact Check team dug into the details of laws already on the books across the country. The New York legislature is considering a bill that would seal the criminal records of some ex-cons who stay out of trouble. I'm back with the Fact Check team. It turns out that several other states have similar laws on the books already. That's right, Eugene. New York would be joining a list of 10 other states that have laws that meet the Clean Slate Initiative's criteria, including New Jersey, California, and Pennsylvania. Each state's law looks a little bit different. For example, some just open eligibility to get records expunged or sealed, while some are automatic. There are also active campaigns to pass similar laws in at least 
least 11 other states and grassroots work to build support for future efforts. Now, Courtney, you mentioned the Clean Slate Initiative's uh, criteria. What exactly is that? That's a good question. For context, the Clean Slate Initiative is a bipartisan organization that supports expanding and sealing arrest and conviction records through process modernization. And there are a few things a state has to do or have when it comes to legislation. Take a look at your screens. For example, a state has to have automation of record clearance and needs to include arrest records. And Connor, what do we know about the effectiveness of these laws? So we did some digging, and this study from the Cato Institute found in Michigan, only 4% of people who had their records expunged are reconvicted within five years, and most of them are nonviolent misdemeanors. And if you look at Utah, which was the second state to pass this kind of law, people who have had their records cleared are more than 60% more likely to get a job, and their wages also improve. But we do want to mention that these laws are all pretty new, so we may not be seeing the full scope of the impact just yet. I'm sure, that's a good point to consider there. Courtney and Connor, thanks so much for your work on this. You can explore this fact check team topic a little more at home. For the team's sources of information, just scan the QR code on your screen or visit us online at thenationaldesk.com. Ahead here on the National Desk, America's News Now, a dent a default averted. Why some lawmakers are saying the bipartisan compromise doesn't go far enough. Plus, the battle over border security, the new plan in Texas to physically curb migrant crossings. No one got everything they wanted, but the American people got what they needed. We averted an economic crisis, an economic collapse. We're cutting spending and bringing the deficits down at the same time. Last week, President Biden signing the bipartisan debt deal passed by both houses and Congress just two days before the country was set to default. But not everyone in Washington was happy about the compromise. This week, I sat down with Kentucky Senator Rand Paul, who voted against the bill. Senator, so the Senate passed a bill last Thursday to raise the debt ceiling. The measure was approved in a bipartisan 63 to 36 vote after passing the House by a wide bipartisan margin. And President Biden signed it two days before the default deadline. Both sides are claiming victory, but we want to know who do you think is the clear winner and loser here? I think the clear loser is the taxpayer and the citizens of the country. I don't think anything about the deal changes the trajectory of accumulation of debt. So we have a $32 trillion national debt, and in two years it's going to be $36 trillion. I see nothing fiscally responsible about that, and I'm worried about what this does to the country. As we begin continue to pay for a debt by having the Federal Reserve print up money, that creates inflation. And so all the prices rising that's been going on for the last couple of years, I think continues and will continue until it finally leads us into recession. So I don't think there's anything good or conservative about the deal. I think what we should do is balance our budget and spend what comes in. New spending limits created by the recently passed debt ceiling deal, they're fueling divisions across party lines. What do you make of, of the curbing of defense funding through a deal reached with President Biden? Well, the interesting thing about the deal is they took mandatory spending, which is two thirds of the spending off the table, and that's still gonna rise at about 5%. Military spending, they took off the table too, and it's going to rise at 3% next year. So mandatory spending, which is Medicare, food stamps, everything going up at 5%, military going up at 3%, what they negotiated over was about 15% of the budget. They call this non-military discretionary spending. And they're gonna hold the line on that for maybe a year. So really, I think they didn't touch the problem. 
See, and if we really are serious people, we have to look at Medicare, we look at Social Security, food stamps, Medicaid. These are the things driving the deficit. If we do nothing about them, I think we could destroy our currency and destroy our country. So no, I don't think the debt uh, deal did anything to help the country. I think we basically kicked the can down. Two years we'll be back here and people will be scratching their heads saying, I thought we had this great deal. But two years from now, we're going to add four more trillion in debt. So they didn't do anything to really change the trajectory of, of the accumulation of debt. Senator Paul, you have introduced a conservative alternative to the Biden-McCarthy debt deal. This alternative will be offered as an amendment, we understand, of the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Talk about your conservative alternative and, and what the other side is saying. Well, the conservative alternative is that we balance our budget in five years. There's been a constitutional amendment proposed for years. In fact, we voted on it in the U.S. Senate and every Republican supported it, but it required balancing the budget over five years. So for several years now, I've put forward this plan, we call it the penny plan. When I first put it forward, it was a 1% cut over five years each year to balance the budget. Now it's actually up to the five penny plan because spending went crazy under COVID. And so now we have such an expansion of spending, you'd have to do a 5% cut. But that's what the penny plan is, and that's what the conservative alternative is. We put in place spending caps that would allow the budget to balance in five years. And some people say, oh my goodness, that's crazy. We could never do it. But we need to realize that over half of Europe, even countries that have enormous social safety nets like Sweden, Germany, countries that we think of as being much more socialized than America, they actually balance their annual budget. Now they do it through a host of taxes. In our country, we do a bait and switch. People say, here's free stuff you won't have to pay for it. Taxes are gonna remain reasonable. In fact, we'll exempt most of the middle class from the income tax, but here's all this free stuff you get from government, but you mm -hmm. get the free stuff through borrowing and then you're paid, you pay for it ultimately through an inflation tax. And that's, I think, the dishonesty of government now as they offer you stuff, but you still have to pay for it, but the pay for is through this hidden tax of inflation. Well, thank you for that breakdown. Much more to come. A lot to unpack here, but we appreciate your time. Senator Rand Paul, thank you for joining us on thank the you. National Desk. New details on the impeachment of Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton. As we give you a look over Austin, the FBI has arrested a Texas businessman whose alleged connection to Paxton was central to his impeachment. Not clear what charges led to the arrest of Nate Paul. Records show Paul is being held on a federal detainer for a felony. Paxton's impeachment trial in the Texas Senate is set to start no later than August 28th. Texas Governor Greg Abbott made something of a surprise announcement this week when he announced new border infrastructure at the state's border with Mexico. It's not the wall, but it's a series of buoys in the river designed to inhibit border crossings by the river, the Rio Grande River. The National Desk Michael Atkinson reports from the Texas Capitol. When Governor Greg Abbott called this immediate special session, he tasked the legislature with addressing border security, specifically by increasing criminal penalties for human smuggling across the border. And with new initiatives like this border of buoys, as well as new legislation addressing border security, the Texas government is towing the line on how far it can go to manage the southern border. A surprise announcement on Thursday is Governor Greg Abbott unveiled a new initiative through the Texas Department of Public Safety designed to mitigate border entries a wall of buoys. We're securing the border at the border. What these buoys will allow us to do is to prevent people from even getting to the border. Like, can you swim under those? But yes, you can or you can't. There's also webbing that'll go down and anchor us to the bottom. But constitutionally, the state is limited in what it can do. Supreme Court precedent puts border security in the hands of the federal, not the state government. But citing is what it sees as errors of the Biden administration, the Texas legislature is walking the line to enact what it can. That includes several border measures signed into law on Thursday, including one that codifies Mexican drug cartels as foreign terrorist organizations, and another that gives Border Patrol authority to arrest people crossing the border. And possibly up next, a bill creating a mandatory minimum sentence of 10 years for human smuggling. This is a picture of a five-year-old girl shoved into the trunk. But let's also give that five-year-old girl and that three-year-old boy sitting in the, tr in, the, in the trunk justice. But the bill isn't without critics, and it's at a stalemate as legislators figure out how far it should go. The maximum sentence you can have for a third-degree felony in Texas is 10 years, and we're talking about both the mandatory and 
the, the mandatory minimum and the maximum sentence for that offense being 10 years. That's an unusual um, scheme to have in our in our penal code. And in this special session, Senate Republicans are trying to pass legislation that goes beyond what Governor Abbott called for, like one bill that would create the state's own Border Patrol unit, which had significant support in both chambers during the regular session, but died when lawmakers couldn't agree on a final version. Governor Abbott coy on whether or not he would pass such measures until the mandatory minimum bill is passed. We are going to get those passed before we take up any other legislation. Returning Texas to another possible question of constitutionality over who maintains the border. The Texas House of Representatives has already adjourned, so they're not here at the Capitol to negotiate, meaning that policies like that Texas Border Patrol may not fare this go around. But Governor Greg Abbott has indicated he will call several special sessions and border security is one of his top priorities. From inside the Texas State Capitol, I'm Mike Ladkisson reporting for the National Desk, America's News Now. Ahead here on the National Desk, fighting road rage, how some Utah residents are taking action after losing loved ones. Plus, working around the lifeguard shortage, how dogs are helping swimmers in Maine stay safe. The National Desk team of reporters is bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America. We start in Utah, where a group in Eagle Mountain has started a road rage action fund after a deadly incident. You see instantly people are just in shock. Wes Howell was driving in the same caravan of Porsches on Sunday as victims Rodney Salm and his girlfriend Misha. There was the Maxima and then there was a big F-150 that was in the shoulder. And it was immediately apparent that something was, uh, was horribly wrong. Now grappling with the shock of it all, Howell says he and others who knew the victims are using their heartache for change. It's just truly tragic and uh, we want to make a difference. How calls this GoFundMe an action campaign. He says money raised will go to causes that spread awareness about road rage, including taking a look at state laws. Republican Senator Todd Weiler says right now in Utah, we log traffic accidents and tickets. However, I don't think we're, we're properly tracking the motivation behind those tickets and those accidents. Those who knew Rodney and Misha want to see more laws specific to road rage. There's a lot of people that will become part of a movement where we can continue to make a difference and hopefully even save some lives. Now over to Washington, D.C. The district has surpassed 100 homicides this year, according to the latest information from the Metropolitan Police Department. The grim milestone was reached Tuesday after a man was shot and killed at a gas station, followed by another shooting that took the life of a woman and injured one other person. This is the earliest D.C. reaches 100 homicides since 2003. And in Maine, Scarborough Beach State Park is working around a lifeguard shortage by hiring two life-saving dogs. Beacon and Bowie are specifically trained to follow lifeguards into the water, there they go, and help pull in the guard and victim. The park's manager says the dogs bring another layer of protection to swimmers and a bit of fun too. 
and the people respect them. They come up and ask if they can pat them, and we let them, and uh, they're very affectionate dogs. Especially little kids. We didn't have little kids that would walk up to the stand before, so I think it's really like helped public safety as well. They are adorable. Right now, Beacon and Bowie are the only Ocean Guard dogs in the U.S. So gotta make a trip to Maine. Still ahead here, building bridges. How a Las Vegas police officer is helping to protect her community against terrorist attacks. Taking a look at the top trending stories on our website right now, this week a Nashville detective walked out of the hospital days after being shot while on assignment. His colleagues meeting him at the door to celebrate his recovery. Then take a look at this stunning video of a car skidding on its side along a sidewalk, the driver walking away from the crash. You can see as we play this video again, employees from the nearby restaurant walking out as the driver stepped out of the car unscathed. Those stories and more available right now at thenationaldesk.com. The Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department has a history maker among its ranks. 49-year-old Farhad Mir is the department's first female Muslim Pakistani officer. Mir helps the department recognize and stop potential terror attacks in the community. She does that by building relationships, especially with face-based organizations, which Mir says are easy targets for attacks. Ahead in our next half hour, close encounters with China by air and sea. New warnings from the U.S. military. Plus, breaking down claims the Chinese hacking groups could target American infrastructure. You're watching the National Desk, America's News Now. You can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time and anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back.
The National Desk, America's News, now. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Dee Dee Gatton. We're happy you're here with us. A new study from the American Academy of Pediatrics shows more youth with anxiety are getting medication, but not therapy. Among anxiety patients, 4 to 24 years old, 62% were prescribed medications, but only about 33% received therapy. Overall, the number receiving any type of treatment, medication, or therapy dropped from about 80% to 71% in the four-year period studied. As summer break begins, parents across the country really may be thinking about setting boundaries when it comes to their kids and electronic devices. The National Desk Atra al Nashar has the latest on new data linking screen time to kids' mental health. So many of America's youth are fighting an internalized battle with mental health struggles. The number of kids and teenagers with anxiety and depression has shot up by about 30% in recent years, according to the Department of Health and Human Services, but many don't get the care they need. Persistent feelings of sadness and suicide attempts reported at higher rates among girls and LGBTQ plus youth, which groups like the National Alliance on Mental Illness are drawing attention to this Pride Month. I started coming out to friends, um, a lot of friends decided that they didn't want to or couldn't be friends with me. Political polarization, spending years apart during the pandemic, more time online, may be contributing to an existing trend of teens spending less time together, observed by researchers at the University of Michigan's Monitoring the Future. Last month, Surgeon General Vivek Morthy called attention to what he calls an epidemic of loneliness and isolation and issued an advisory about effects of social media on young people, but says more research is needed to understand it fully. This is the defining public health issue of our time, youth mental health. In recent months, dozens of lawmakers from both sides of the aisle and both chambers of Congress have introduced legislation to require social media companies to take more steps to protect kids, limit harmful content, and give parents more controls and rights to take legal action against a platform. So that parents and children can take back their lives. It is as if children are being robbed of their childhood. Though many aren't waiting, hundreds of lawsuits have already been filed. Medical experts are hard at work, too, to prevent crisis scenarios. Doctors at Cincinnati Children's Hospital recently published a set of recommendations, and one of them is to have more mental health providers at pediatricians' offices to identify treatment needs early on in a person's life. In Washington, I'm Atrel Nishar for the National Desk, America's News Now. Developing now, the PGA Tour and Live Golf are set to merge the two competitions butt heads when the Saudi-backed Live Golf launched last June. Many players and the PGA commissioner bash golfers who joined for accepting money from the country accused of several human rights violations. The families of 9-11 victims also chimed in on the announcement, calling it deeply offensive. Everyone is feeling the same way, outraged, disappointed, angry, disgusted that, chair, that um, Monaghan could now sell the PGA to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia knowing that they are culpable in murdering our loved ones. The new agreement would end the legal feuding between the parties and according to a statement, it would end all pending litigation. Right now, the White House is warning of increased aggressiveness from the Chinese military after two recent close encounters, one by sea, one by air. National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby says in both instances, the U.S. was operating in compliance with international law and that there was no need for China to respond so aggressively. It won't be long before somebody gets hurt. Uh, that's, the, that's the concern with these unsafe and unprofessional intercepts. Uh, they can lead to misunderstandings. They can lead to miscalculations. And the U.S. Navy released this video of what it calls an unsafe Chinese maneuver in the Taiwan Strait. You can see the Chinese ship cutting sharply across the path of an American destroyer, forcing the U.S. vessel to slow down to avoid a crash, we're told. Just last month, a Chinese fighter jet flew directly in front of a U.S. military aircraft over the South China Sea. Analysts at Microsoft believe a Chinese hacking group is working to disrupt critical communications infrastructure the U.S. could use in future crises. 
Earlier this week, I spoke with the fact check team about why some hospitals should also be on high alert, according to experts. The threat of cyber attacks is back in the spotlight after a state-sponsored Chinese hacking group has been spying on critical U.S. infrastructure organizations, according to Microsoft and Western intelligence agencies. And I'm here with the fact check team. Janae, starting with you, the FBI yeah. is warning hospitals to be on high alert. Why is that? Well, Didi, it's scary to think about, but medical devices like insulin pumps, defibrillators, nurse call buttons, and pacemakers are at risk of cyber attacks. Now, this could look like a bad actor getting access to an insulin pump and stopping the flow of insulin altogether or giving a patient too much insulin. Either way, a serious complication. And an FBI report found 53% of connected medical devices and other internet-based devices in hospitals are critically vulnerable to hacks. Concerning details in that report, Courtney, speak to us about protection for this important infrastructure. Didi, the Food and Drug Administration has faced years of criticism for not protecting medical devices from getting hacked. In fact, back in 2018, the Health and Human Services Office of the Inspector General called out the agency for not doing enough. The FDA did put out new guidance in March requiring that medical devices meet specific cybersecurity guidelines, and those new requirements were passed into law under the 1.7 trillion dollar spending bill signed back in December. It's important to keep in mind, though, that this law applies to new medical devices and doesn't protect the millions that are currently in use. An important topic for more on this information, including links to where the fact check team found their sources. Just scan that QR code on your screen or visit the nationaldesk.com. Turning now to the border crisis, a federal appeals court in Atlanta has ruled the Biden administration cannot implement certain border policies saying DHS hasn't gone far enough to prove they're necessary. The court denying a stay to allow DHS to release some asylum seekers into the U.S. on a parole basis. The ruling marks another policy win for Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who's spearheading the lawsuit in protest of the president's handling of immigration. Meantime, New York City is set to receive over $100 million from FEMA to help asylum seekers. More than 72,000 migrants have passed through the city since last spring, with more than 44,000 currently in the city's care. In a joint statement, New York lawmakers Chuck Schumer and Hakeem Jeffries calling the funds a strong step in the right direction. A supreme surprise from the high court. The justices siding with civil rights activists in Alabama, striking down Republican-drawn congressional districts in the state. Chief Justice John Roberts and Justice Brett Kavanaugh, both conservatives, join the court's three liberals in the majority. This means the map of the seven congressional districts will be redrawn. The state's first black woman elected to Congress says the decision will lead to more equitable maps in Alabama. I think that it's about making sure that minority voters have a, a voice and um, obviously, representation matters, mm -hmm. and so not having a voice has been really pivotal. Advocates arguing the power of black voters in Alabama was being taken away by dividing voters into districts that white voters dominate. Alabama arguing too much emphasis was being put on race. The Supreme Court has yet to release the decisions on 23 cases that it's heard this term, and it has about four weeks left to release them. Earlier this week, I sat down with trial attorney Karen Conti to get her take on the remaining decisions we can expect from the high court. Karen, so at issue, the affirmative action programs at the University of North Carolina and Harvard. In the past, we know the court has ruled that affirmative action is constitutional. What's different about these cases? How do you think the court will rule? The cases are not different. The court is different. Much like in the Roe versus Wade strike down, uh, we have now a more conservative court. So 40 years ago, the court said, yeah, we have an interest in making sure our schools are diverse. And so there's a compelling interest to treat people differently. This court is very skeptical of that. We tried that, said the court. We looked at that. We did that. And now we can't treat people differently under the 14th Amendment equal protection uh, clause and also under the civil rights laws. So I think we're going to see affirmative action stricken down. And we know this is a case we will be watching really closely. The court also, though, heard a case in April where a U.S. postal worker claimed his religious belief did not allow him to work on Sundays. So at what point does an employer have to accommodate the religious beliefs of an employee under the First Amendment? And which way do you think the court is leaning? 
currently the employer has to accommodate, but if it causes any burden at all on the employer, the employer does not have to accommodate. This plaintiff says, no, the standard should be different. It should be that there has to be some undue hardship in order for you not to accommodate me. So the court here is going to be tasked with determining whether or not we should create a new standard to make it easier for plaintiffs to succeed in these kinds of cases. My guess is this court is gonna create a new standard uh, that accommodates employees uh, in a better way. And I think the case is gonna be sent down to the court to determine whether uh, they in fact met that standard. Another case involves the appeal of a man convicted of stalking. And the issue is, is what constitutes a true threat? Break down this case, uh, arguments on both sides. Yeah, very interesting. It was a, a guy was convicted of stalking a local musician in Colorado by sending a lot of stuff online. And the question is, when does uh, the the right to speak under the First Amendment actually morph into a crime that is actually threatening? So the question is, is this a true threat, or is or, or is it just how the person perceives it? So again, these are just gradations of how what needs to be proven in order to uh, make a speech into a crime. And again, I think the court is. Going to retool the uh, the standard, and I think this guy's conviction may be overturned. Let's move on to disgraced financier Jeffrey Epstein, who died by suicide while in prison. Thousands of new documents have been released that really give us a glimpse into his last days. Karen, what stood out to you from that information? Well, not that anyone really, uh, really has a lot of sympathy for Mr. Epstein, but this prison was poorly run. It was just negligence from start to finish. I mean, the the the, the it was just a horrible place to be. There, uh, toilets didn't work. Nothing worked. And this guy tried to commit suicide. Days later, he was found dead. He was put on suicide watch. Strangely, he was taken off. He had a, a cellmate that was supposed to be in the cell with him who wasn't there. We had two guards who were supposed to be watching him who were sound asleep, and the camera weren't working so nothing worked here and you know it, it really created a situation that allowed him to kill himself if you're a conspiracy theorist you might have a different opinion on that all right well karen always appreciate your insight thanks so much for coming on the national desk sure Still to come here, our team of correspondents breaks down this week in Washington from renewed concerns over the nation's supply chain to the economic impact of brand boycotts And welcome back. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day to report on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. The Bureau's correspondents are here with their insights on the stories they've been covering. President Biden vetoed a bill this past week that would have canceled his student loan relief plan. National correspondent Christine Frizzau, explain why this isn't the last we'll hear about this issue. Yeah, certainly this bill, which passed in both the Senate and the House, would have undone a policy that he sort of viewed as a signature policy, a student loan forgiveness plan that would have forgiven uh, $20,000 in student loans for those who went to college on Pell Grants, $10,000 for some other students who met certain requirements. Um, obviously, he doesn't want this to be done away with. But the reason that we're not done with this is because there are arguments before the Supreme Court in a case called Biden v. Nebraska, a handful of states that also don't want this plan to go forward. They say it would cost too much money. Um, they're suing. And in the oral arguments, at least, the Supreme Court seemed, seemed to side with them. So there's a good chance that they will undo this as well. So we'll see what happens. But for now, with that veto, it's on hold. Meanwhile, growing concerns about the nation's supply chain again. National correspondent Atra Elmashar, what's going on? Right, so this is happening along the West Coast. What you've got is a uh, standoff about 
contract negotiations between a union representing tens of thousands of longshoremen and warehouse workers uh, and the uh, cargo companies that they serve in, on these ports. Uh, so there hasn't been an official strike yet. We don't know that there will be, but there have been worker disruptions that have started to cause backlogs of shipping containers. And yes, it's June, but we're actually in peak holiday shipping season, of course, too. Back to school items are on a lot of these uh, uh, shipping containers. So you could see in the short term, perhaps product shortages, perhaps inflationary pressure. But in the long term, Steve, the concern is that companies will move their supply chains away from the West Coast because they're nervous about more and more disruptions, whether they're because of unions or because of uh, sailing conditions in the Indo-Pacific or you name it when it comes to supply chain issues and, and where they're derived from. Uh, and of course, that could, in the end, impact jobs on the West Coast. And national correspondent Kayla Gaskins, more companies facing backlash over taking public positions on social issues. What's the latest there? Well, Bank of America is the latest target by conservative companies. They're accusing the bank of placing progressive policies with a higher importance over uh, creating profits, which is what a bank is supposed to do. Now, this is an example of one of their uh, one of their policies is that they allow they will pay for employees who want to travel out of state to get an abortion if they live in, an, in a state where abortion it has been restricted or there's been any sort of ban. Now, Bank of America says that policies like these allow them to operate at the best capacity and ultimately turn around the best profits. Bank of America, not the only company coming under fire from conservative groups. There's also Target and Bud Light that have been making headlines for more than a month now with them coming out uh, being pro-trans uh, right. And they're finding conservative consumers are now boycotting those companies and they're seeing some pretty big economic hits. I spoke to an expert today and he said that CEOs are paying very close attention to how this all plays out because once you start entering those political discussions, it can be very dangerous for companies. Steve. Kayla, Atra, Christine, thanks for your top-notch reporting and thanks for your hard work. Back to you. Thanks, team. New numbers here reveal first-time jobless claims jumped last week to the highest level since October of 2021. According to the Labor Department, U.S. applications for jobless claims, 261,000 for the week ending June 3rd, an increase of 28,000 from the previous week. Weekly jobless claims have been going up recently, a hint of some softening in the U.S. labor market. However, first-time claims still remain below historical averages. And new details on the push for a shorter work week. Some business leaders have already started implementing the four-day work week and say it's increased productivity. But as states push for changes, experts shared with me challenges to making this the norm. There's really been no downside for us with not working on Fridays. Trials for a shorter week are taking place around the world. An experiment in the UK from June to December 2022 found 92% of companies say they're continuing with the four-day week. The report cited benefits to employees' well-being and improved productivity in organizations undertaking the change, something in line with what some U.S. companies are seeing. I would say most of the full-time employees on the team that are doing the four-day work week are still working roughly the same amount of hours, but it's just Monday through Thursday. It actually ends up being more productive. It's really just about the output, and I'm not as concerned about micromanaging every hour that people work. Experts say the pandemic inspired many to rethink their workplace structure, but add this is not for every industry. But we do have a manufacturer right now that's trying to go three 12-hour shifts, two days off, three 12-hour shifts, two days off in the same vein of trying to give a better work-life balance. But depending on the industry you're in, a doctor's office per se, uh, you know, when you can see your clients and when you can get things done, it would be hard to just mandate it across the board. And according to a CBS News review, at least half a dozen states are on some level looking at legislation to make the four-day work week more common. Ahead here on the National Desk, killed in the line of duty, the emotional outpouring of support for a trooper officials say was targeted in an ambush.
This is the National Desk, America's News Now. Our team of nearly 4,000 local journalists bringing you the headlines from coast to coast, from homeless camp problems in Washington to 3D printed homes on sale in Texas. We're taking the pulse of America, but we start with the support for the family of a West Virginia trooper killed in the line of duty. The outpouring of support has been a tsunami. Initially set to raise $10,000 for the family, the GoFundMe page has outgrown its goal twice, and the funds just keep rolling in. The amount of people that know Corey, know, knew him, uh, and he impacted is just amazing. Now the family is trying to bottle that support long-term for Corey Maynard's children, Zoe and Finn. They're you know, going on without their father. Sergeant Corey Maynard was active in his community. He was set to help with the Williamson Library summer program on Monday. But he was fatally shot in the line of duty on Friday when responding to a call about a man with a rifle on Beach Creek Road in Mingo County. He, he never met a stranger and, and the kids loved him. You could go into a room and see him talking to people and everyone around them had smiles on their eyes. We just want you guys to know that we love you, man. We want to get these guys into services. We want to continue sharing that, hey, there's a better way, there's a better life. You don't have to live like this. We shadowed this outreach volunteer here at the newest hot spot for Berrien's homeless. There's a skate park right there. There's little children that come to play on this playground. And so it is rather unfortunate. All the people in this camp simply traveled a few blocks after they were forced from this site. Already eviction warnings have been posted here, all as people nearby grapple with this sudden, unexpected addition to their neighborhoods. That's why my kids, they play here. He don't want to go over there. With tents now posted so close to his kid's favorite play spot, this man says he has no choice but to come to the skate park up the street. We buy the house like close by here because that's the park here. Like that's why. But now, my kids, they're scared. Currently, half a dozen tents are located here at Duddy Harper Park as Burian's homeless problem scatters throughout town. Like, let's say you take a guy from his tent and you leave. Tomorrow, there's going to be somebody else in that tent. Home buyers looking for a unique space in the Austin suburbs are now getting their first chance to buy into a one-of-a-kind neighborhood at Icon's first 3D printed community. Six homes printed by these robots will be up for sale later this week in Georgetown's Wolf Ranch. A lot of people are looking for something different, they're looking for a disruption. This is the dice floor plan. At not quite 1,600 square feet, it has three bedrooms, two baths, and a kitchen island. It is the lowest priced home in the community. Our first home starts at 475000 and we go up into the, the high 500. These inch thick layers of cement based technology have generated a lot of buzz. We've seen first time home buyers. The question now is will interest in learning about these innovative homes translate into buying them? We've priced these homes to be on par with the current market for traditionally built homes.
Looking ahead to stories making headlines this week on Monday, the president is set to host NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg one month before the military alliances summit, the war in Ukraine at the top of their agenda. Then Tuesday and Wednesday, the Fed is meeting to make its next interest rate decision. Officials reportedly divided on whether to raise rates. The market's right now predicting a pause on any hikes. Before we go, a 10-year-old girl is now safe after getting lost in the Cascade Mountains for over 24 hours. This girl was separated from her family during a gathering at the Cathedral Pass Trailhead. Officials say she was found alive with only minor scrapes the next day, about a mile and a half south of where she was last seen. She reportedly told rescuers after finding herself alone, she hiked downstream and spent the night between some trees. Authorities are calling her extraordinarily resourceful and resilient. And that's going to do it for us on the weekend edition of the National Desk, America's News Now. Don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time. Just check your local listings. You can also watch us online and catch up with the latest headlines on thenationaldesk.com. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you back here next week.